Okay, I guess we should get started then. Um, well, um, hello everyone. I uh, want to welcome you to the Alan Berkman Memorial Lecture as part of the Columbia University Epidemiology Grand Rounds. Uh, this special event is being co-hosted with the Department of Social Medical Sciences. Um, a special thanks to Merlin and to Gerald for help organizing this event. And of course, our speakers. Um, but before we start, I wanted to take a few minutes um, of your time to tell you a quick story about one of my many experiences with Alan, but something that, is, uh, that I've kept actually uh, for, uh, for a while. Uh, Alan was my academic advisor during my doctoral studies here uh, at Epi at Mailman now many years ago. Um, when I first learned that he was going to be my advisor, I was very thrilled. Uh, I did know of him. I knew of his uh, work, tremendous work on HIV. Uh, in New York, and particularly his work in South Africa. So uh, being uh, also working in infectious diseases, I was, uh, I was absolutely thrilled to have him as my advisor. Um, as most uh, sessions, most of our sessions were uh, exceptionally illuminating, thoughtful. Um, you know, he was, uh, he was very wise and, you know, very kind, I would say. Um, but, you know, he would certainly push me, uh, push me and he urged me to challenge. Uh, he challenged me to couch my work into a larger conversation. That was very important, into a larger dialogue. And of, co and of course, occasionally, he would urge me to hurry along and just finish up. Admittedly, I did take a long time to finish up. Um, in any case, um, while still a student, uh, I, ended, uh, I attended a TV conference in Vancouver where I met Jerry Friedland, a luminary in the field of HIV and TB from Yale, and a very longtime friend of Alan's. We spoke of Alan and how he was doing, and he was going through a tough time then, medical uh, issues during that time period. Uh, then he said to me that you know, his life, Alan's life, has been like no other lots of tough times that he's managed to get through and that it's really hard to imagine. At that point, I wasn't quite sure what he was referring to. I, I thought to myself, was it just academia? And I probably could relate to that. Um, but in any case, uh, he did say uh, that that was Alan's story to tell and that I should ask him. Um, I did not see Alan again. Uh, and I subsequently learned of Alan's story. So um, I feel especially privileged on behalf of the Grand Rounds Committee and the department to host the Berkman Lecture of the Year. Uh, so with that, thank you for attending, and I will hand over to Charlie Brannis, the Chair of Epidemiology. Thank you. Thank you, Barun, uh, for leading the department's uh, Grand Rounds Committee that's uh, put this together along with uh, Merlin Chakwanyan and uh, David Rosner at the Center for History and Ethics of Public Health, and of course, the Department of Sociomedical Sciences. Um, between the two of them, they co-sponsored Alan, and we're pleased when he was faculty at, at Mailman, and we're pleased that, um, that the two departments are now co-sponsoring this today. Uh, and please join me in thanking the Zeller Berkman families for their continued support of this annual lecture, and indeed, um, a very special thanks goes to Barbara Zeller, who was Alan's partner for many years, uh, and who was key, I think, in reading it uh, to the completion of the book Co-Conspirator for Justice in housing and making connections for its author, among other things. And uh, the other thing about Barbara, if you read the book, uh, is that you know, she organized support for Alan throughout his complicated journey, shared his, quote, social rage, uh, and, quote, proved herself uh, separately from Alan and everything he had done. So uh, just a special thank you to Barbara. Um, with that, we're honored to be joined today to reflect on the legacy of Columbia epidemiologist Alan Berkman by two eminent historians, Donna Murch and Susan Reverby. So Donna Murch is Associate Professor of History at Rutgers University. Uh, she is currently completing a new trade press book entitled Crack in Los Angeles, Policing the Crisis and the War on Drugs. She also has a forthcoming book of essays that will be published later this year entitled Asata Taught Me, State Violence, Mass Incarceration, and the Movement for Black Lives. In 2010, she published the award-winning monograph, which is a fantastic read that I'd recommend to all of you, uh, Living for the City, Migration, Education, and the Rise of the Black Panther Party in Oakland, California. 
uh, which won the Phyllis Wheatley Prize. She's written for the Sunday Washington Post, uh, The New Republic, The Nation, The Chronicle for Higher Education, Black Scholar, and the Journal of American History, among other places, and has appeared in Stanley Nelson's documentary, uh, Black Panther's Vanguard of the Revolution that is now being aired on PBS. Thank you very much for joining us, Donna. It's wonderful to have you. Susan Reverby is the Marion Butler McLean Professor Emerita in the History of Ideas and Professor Emerita of Women's and Gender Studies at Wellesley College, uh, a historian of American women, race, medicine, public health, and nursing. Um, <clears throat> She taught at Wellesley for 34 years and was the college's first hire in women's studies. She has held fellowships at the Ratcliffe Institute, the W.B. Du Bois Institute, and the National Library of Medicine. Her book, Tuskegee's Truths, Rethinking the Tuskegee Syphilis Study, won uh, the Vizeltier Prize from the APHA, the Ralph Walter em Emerson Prize from the National Phi Beta Kappa, and the Soulsby Prize from the Alabama History Association. As part of her research on Tuskegee, she found the records of unpublished US research in Guatemala in the 1940s that revealed deliberate exposure of over a thousand prisoners, psychiatric patients, soldiers, and sex workers to syphilis and gonorrhea. She, she subsequently shared this scholarship with the Centers for Disease Control in October of 2010. Uh, and the US government issued a formal apology to Guatemala, leading to worldwide uh, media coverage, lawsuits, and, and a report uh, from the White House President's Bioethics Commission. Her latest book, Co-Conspirator for Justice, The Revolutionary Life of Alan Berkman, was just published this past June of 2020. Again, I highly recommend this, and it is the subject of today's discussion. Thank you, Susan, for joining us as well. Now, Susan, um, we're going to start off, and since Alan passed away now over a decade ago, I wonder if you'd start by giving us a thumbnail narrative about Alan uh, for the benefit of those of us who did not know him personally. And then uh, we're hoping that you and Donna take this in whatever directions you think best. Just at the end, I'll say, and please type your questions in the chat or the question box so that we can pose them to Donna uh, and Susan at the end. The floor Great. is yours. Thank you. So do you want me to do a whole quick summary of his life in five minutes? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, but quickly, just to, just to ground folks who, okay. unlike Barun, have not met. Him. Okay. So as Barun made uh, clear, Alan Berkman, uh, when he died in 2009, was a, um, an esteemed uh, epidemiologist at Columbia. And he had helped start in uh, early 1999 and in 2000, an organization called Health Gap, the Health Global Access Project, which fought successfully to change US trade policy so that antiretrovirals and generic forms of the antiretrovirals could go into the global south. And he probably helped contribute to saving millions of people's lives. Um, so he when he died in 2009, he was really a kind of hero of the HIV movement and of the um, and of epidemiology in terms of the kinds of per people who work with communities um, directly to change, um, you know, policy and to take into account what communities really need. So before there was really prep for HIV, Allen really understood that just talking about prevention um, which we often do on the left, particularly in epidemiology, um, was not enough, that there had to be treatment um, as well. So that's his sort of end of his life history from about 1992 on, when he first worked in an, in an AIDS uh, hospital um, and nursing home in New York, and then became connected to uh, Columbia and got training as a researcher and epidemiologist. But the Allen Burke that I knew was a person I grew up with in a little town in upstate New York, about 70 miles from the city called Middletown. Um, very much Republican, very small town at the time we were growing up. And then we uh, went to, um, sorry, uh, went to Cornell uh, together and um, I was organizing draft card burning and was in SDS and he was, uh, Sorry, my phone keeps going off. Um, 
and he uh, was uh, president of his fraternity and playing football. So in 1967, if you had asked me which one of us was going to be uh, in trouble with the government in a few years, it certainly wouldn't have been Alan. But what happened was that he came to Columbia in the fall of 1967 to go to medical school, and he became increasingly politicized. He became part of a group called Prairie Fire that was an outgrowth of the Students for Democratic Society. He became increasingly willing to help people who were taking more armed uh, stances toward the United States government, including people in the Black Liberation Army and in something called the FALN, which was a group of uh, people fighting the colonial position of Puerto Rico. And in 1981, so think about 1981 in terms of AIDS. So in, uh, in, in June of 1981, we get the first CDC report about AIDS. But in October of 1981, the Black Liberation Army, with the help of people who were in the political group Allen was then part of, um, tried to do what they called an expropriation of a um, Brinks truck um, to get money to continue the revolution. And they were, uh, there was a shootout, two Brinks, uh, two policemen and a Brinks guard were killed. People ended up going to prison and one of the women doing the driving accidentally shot herself and Allen was then called to provide medical care for her and he did not report the gunshot wound which you're required to do in New York State. So long story short, the government goes after him. He does some time for refusing to speak to a grand jury. And then he realizes he thinks he's going to get years and years and years and decades, maybe even in prison. So he and other people in his group go underground and they become a kind of uh, underground army in an attempt to, to basically remind the United States government that it can't do what it's doing. And they did seven or eight bombings of places like the Senate, the Police Benevolent uh, uh, Association in New York, uh, the Israeli Embassy, the um, uh, the United States, the Embassy, the uh, Navy Yard, and, and an FBI office. And eventually, by 1985, everybody gets caught in various ways. Um, and um, so he goes to prison. Um, and he goes to prison for almost eight very, very hard years. And while he's in prison, and he has two rounds of FOMA that almost kill him. And had he not been a physician, he would not have survived. But he eventually uh, gets out. And in 1992, he becomes an AIDS doctor in New York. And that's the Berkman that you get to know. So that's the quick version of uh, a long book <laughs> that you should read. That's it. Thank you so much for that, Susan. That was an amazing job giving us a thumbnail sketch and an overview. And I think in this conversation, what we'll do is revisit some of those individual moments that you were talking about and talk about them in greater detail. Um, first, I just want to thank everyone who organized this event. Um, Charles, Merlin, Baroon, David, Susan. I'm so honored to be here and to share this moment to talk about Susan's brilliant book that's come out. and to kind of think about how to place it both in our current moment and in its own historical context. Um, so I had great pleasure of meeting Susan Reverby about four years ago. And then we were in a seminar at Harvard that was um, presided over by Elizabeth Hinton about crime and punishment. And it was there that I first read sections of the manuscript, which I loved and really started a dialogue with Susan that we've been having ever since. And one of the things that really stood out to me about Susan's book is that I'm a, I, my first book was about the Black Panther Party. And I really have kind of spent my whole life researching and teaching different aspects of the party. And one thing I'm really struck by is that we have seen in the last 20 years a complete and utter re revision and even reinvention of how we understand the post-war social movements. So, you know, I came from a generation of historians in graduate school where none of the history of the Black Power Movement had been written. We were using primary sources and in many ways writing about a critical historiography that saw Black Power and Black Liberation, the radical movements that followed the golden era of the civil rights movement from the 1955 Brown versus the Board of Education decision through the passage of the Voting Rights Act that saw the period after of 
massive urban rebellions of black radical organizations like the Black Panther Party, the Republic for New Africa, and of course the Black Liberation Army, which is the direct context for understanding Allen's activism, that that had been the bete noir and that history hadn't been written. And what's been amazing is that over the last 20 years, we've seen a complete transformation of this historiography. We have many, many monographs about the Black Power Movement. The Panthers has now spawned over a dozen monographs. And we also have a new monograph out about the Republic of New Africa. So it's really been an amazing kind of super vibrant period for reinterpreting what radical protest means. And of course, it deeply resonates with this moment as we have witnessed in the last five months in total numbers of people going out on the streets, the largest protest movement in American history. And it took form not of juridical and legal organization, but largely of urban rebellions, including some attacks on property and expropriation. So I think there's a particular rhyming right now of what's going on right now. And then what's going on in the late 60s that helps us also understand Alan Berkman through a range of lenses. So um, one of the, I think, unfortunate things, and I think Susan and I will be revisiting this throughout our talk today, is that while we've had this really amazing history being written, especially of Black, Brown, and other multiracial organizations, much less has been written about the white new left, if, as they used to be called. And I think this is an incredibly important story. It, there's so much more research that's needed on it. And Susan's new book is one of the best sources I've ever read. And a lot of us are relying really on a generation uh, you know, of books that were written in the 1970s about this period. So um, I wanted to start just by asking Susan about what your inspiration was for writing this book and how you understand Alan's own radicalization. How do we fit together the multiple Alan Berkmans, <laughs> nice Jewish boy and Eagle Scout from Middletown, a participant in armed struggle that identified with the radical wing of the Black Liberation Movement, academic, public health activist and glo global AIDS activist. How do we fit those things together? So um, I think one of the ways to, um, to think about him is, uh, is really about our upbringing um, in Middletown because I think uh, it really explains sort of uh, some of us obviously um, it, who become part of the new left in the 60s and 70s, which is that we were sold hook, line and sinker, at least the white um, sort of working class to middle class group about uh, America the greatest, about what it meant um, to be an American, how terrible the Soviet Union was. I mean, neither of us came from left families um, where any of that would have been part of the tradition. His, um, so I think we bought all of that. And I still, I, thinking back on this, I can remember when I got to Cornell and I started writing that kind of what we would now think of as a MAGA position in my first political science paper. And I remember whoever the grad student was, bless his heart, writing, are you sure? Do you know? Blah, blah. <laughs> you know, the kind of things we ask. So I think we were really steeped in it. And Alan, you know, in writing about it later says, you know, I thought there could be like liberal solutions, you know. And so I think increasingly um, me during college, but I think him more by the end of college and then into, um, into medical school. I mean, I, I always think, for example, if he had gone to Harvard, which he also got into for medical school rather than to Columbia, would this story have been completely, you know, different? It's like my father, for example, refused to let any of my other siblings go to Cornell because he thought Cornell had completely ruined me. So, um, I think that when he got to Columbia, he was already beginning to think about this. He had had a black roommate um, in uh, in uh, undergraduate school, and then at the, an, an undergraduate school, and then his senior year in college, he went to hear um, Stokely Carmichael speak, and he talks about that as his kind of aha moment, where Carmichael basically said, "Whose side are you on?" And he had to really think about that. And the other thing about Alan is. As one of my high school friends put it, I thought was great. He said, look, we were all smart, but Alan was really, really smart. And he like won all the awards in high school, including the history award for which I will never forgive him. Um, but he was a really smart guy and he could see things and he could see big picture in ways that other people couldn't. The only thing he couldn't do is that we were lab partners actually in biology and he got squeamish. This is actually fascinating over the frog. 
that we had to dissect, even though um, I had no trouble with the frog, but he did. So by the time he's at Columbia and he sees what happens at Columbia in 1968, when the police basically start beating up students and he's part of the medical student crew that helps them, I think he's starting to change. And then the, the Panther 21 case happens in New York and one of the people falsely accused of um, actions in New York is someone that people at Columbia knew who had been a biochemist at Columbia. So it becomes very real um, when King dies and the, uh, the you know, rebellions happen in New York, they're very near to Columbia. So all of this is going on. He's part of realizing all of this happening. So with his friends at, um, you know, at Columbia, he begins to be willing to do a few things like, fly a national, uh, uh, an NFL, a national uh, freedom liberation movement from Vietnam, um, flag up the, the flagpole in, at Columbia over the medical school. Um, what else did they do? They made Molotov cocktails and they threw them at um, army recruiting stations. So he's beginning, and then suddenly people are in the underground are saying, listen, we need a doctor. Are you willing to do this? So both he and his eventually wife, Barbara Zeller, who's also a med student with him, Barbara and Allen are willing to help people who can't go to an emergency room for the obvious reasons. So he gets accepted to Columbia. So I think that's a lot of what happens. He gets increasingly involved. And as he's helping to take care of people who have been really severely beaten by the police, he begins to really question his kind of liberal stance. And then I think the other major thing that happens, because this is the story that he tells over and over, although sometimes in the story it's a woman, but sometimes in the story it's a man, it's about a patient that he has when he's a physician and she has, or he has congestive heart failure. And Alan sends her home to walk up five flights of stairs in a tenement and he realizes that all his skill at titrating her medicines and what he can do for her can't change the political situation and economic situation that she's living in and that he has to do something about that if he's really going to save her. So he comes to the realization of what we talk about in health politics, a lot of what we call focusing upstream. That is, the story is that you're a health professional or worker and you're standing by a stream and the bodies keep falling in and it's suddenly you're pulling them out and pulling them out. And then suddenly you realize it behooves you to figure out why they're being pushed in in the first place and it's called focusing upstream. So I think for him um, being at Columbia at that time and then working with the people he was working with, it becomes, how does he focus upstream? And that answer, for all of us is different, but for Alan, it became increasingly willing to support people who were doing much more militant um, things. So I always tell the story, and I tell the story in the book. In 1970, Bobby Seale, uh, president of the Panther, head of the Panthers, and Erica Huggins are on trial in New Haven for a murder they did not commit. Um, and Alan came to see me, and we were both living in New York, and we had lost track a, a little bit, but we saw each other occasionally in New York after we graduated. And he said, if Bobby is convicted, are you willing to take up arms? And I looked at him like, oh my God, first of all, what the hell happened to you? And I said, look, um, I'm a labor historian by training, um, really initially. We always get killed. So I don't think we can outshoot them. So that my answer was no, even though I actually knew how to use a rifle. Um, but I said, you know, I just think this is nuts. This is not the way to do it. But I, I always think of that story. And I told that story over and over again to my students as a way to say, these were the issues. I mean, we had to think about were our, the men in our lives going to burn their draft cards? My wedding witness went to prison for destroying his birth, uh, his draft card. Um, were we going to house, um, deserters from the army who didn't want to fight in the war. I mean, we, and then, you know, I was in the women's health movement in New York, what we were going to do to help people who needed abortion. So in the early years in the seventies in New York, we were doing things like letting our addresses be used to bring people into New York to get care. So all of that's part of that moment where we're doing sort of extra legal things, some more dangerous than others. And I think that's that question of how did that happen to Alan and why he did it became the question I wanted to answer in this book. Thank you for that. Um, I think another piece of this is one, a lot of this history of the new left in many ways is a history of Jewish radicalism. <laughs> and I think that this is, there's so much more research that needs to be done in this. I've been talking to Ben Baltazar, who's a literary scholar, who's essentially working on the late Cold War and Jewish radicalism. But I think understanding it that in that context is also, I think, an important lens to 
understand this through. So thinking of that, um, I have a question that is about linking the past and the present. And first of all, the title of your book, I'd like to hear you know, how you came up with that title. And I wanted to say that I think another one of the really important lessons in, student, in Susan's book is thinking about other ways in which white people can act in concert with forms of black, brown, and other radical activism. So I think that in some ways there's the tradition that it's invoked, but I don't think it's always fully understood of going back to the late 1960s and thinking about organizations like the Black Panther Party. So today, for example, for the, for the movement for Black Lives and the many different organizations that compose it, Asada Shakur has emerged as kind of a core figure that is um, frames and inspires contemporary activism. But in thinking about Panthers activism, they had a very different model of what their relationships, what the relationships were between um, racial, different racial and ethnic communities that first of all, they saw themselves acting in coalition with one another. So the argument was that you could have an all black organization like the Black Panther Party and then its descendant, the Black Liberation Army and value all black organization and see it as an extension of self-determination, but working in conjunction and as, um, as allies, if you will, um, in, fight, in fighting imperialism, opposing the Vietnam War, being explicitly anti-capitalist, working in certain traditions of global and third world Marxism. But there really was a notion that it was the shared ideology and that shared commitment also to a politics of a community-based organization, but if need be, direct confrontation with the state. So I'd like to hear more about why you chose the title you did and what we learned from Alan about an older generation of white radicals relationships to the Black liberation movement. All right. Okay, I, I'm gonna take it apart in two parts. So I'm gonna just talk about Alan and the Jewish part. Um, so one of the things that's interesting about his family history is um, he comes from a more working class family, for example, and his grandfather, so the story in the family that some of the brothers acknowledge, others don't, is that there was an, a, a grandfather who had actually killed a Cossack somewhere in the, um, in the old country and had come to New York and was a uh, junk dealer in New York. So one of the things that happens for people who are junk dealers is that they have to also fight the mafia. Um, in, you know, in Brooklyn, there were fights over who controlled what. And I also found evidence, although it's not exactly clear whether Alan's family did this or not, when, the, when Israel starts to um, become a state in 1947, 48, it, has to, it knows it's gonna, um, gonna be at war with the Arab um, states around it, but the British won't let them build an armament. So the question is, where is Israel, where are the Israelis going to get, uh, the Jewish Israelis going to get their um, armaments? And so Alan, so what happens is in New York, the German Jews help raise the money, but it's the working class, uh, you know, Eastern European Jewish junk dealers who actually collect all the munitions and then get them. Um, to the port of New York, and they actually go through Nicaragua, <laughs> actually then to Cyprus and then to Israel. And there's a story in, the fa in Alan's family about his father and his uncle actually running these guns from the collection of the family. Um, to, and then they get stopped actually by an Irish American cop who says, oh, it's against the British, fine, no problem, and lets them continue <laughs> to take. So that story, whether apocryphal or true, floated through Alan's family. So I think part of it is that to think about him personally, not just as um, a Jewish intellectual who gets, a, as we were in Hebrew school, taught all the sort of history of what it meant um, to be Jewish and the history of the pogroms, but it's also that we were the first generation post the Holocaust. And so you see this a lot in the language of uh, Jewish new leftists. I see it in particularly in Mark Rudd, who led, was one of the people who led the rebellion at Columbia, fear of being a good German. So there is this sense of, oh my God, what if we agree to let the state do these kinds of things? I mean, right, like recently I, I thought about that when I put on my Facebook page, because I have family members who are supporting Trump, and I put on my Facebook page, this is about the family separations. And I say, how can you accept this? How can you think that this is okay? So I think 
coming out of the Holocaust, there was this sense of both, we're not going to go quietly into that night, um, and in terms of understanding our own positions, but also we're not going to be complicit. And that was a lot of what I think we um, learned. So I think that's the background. And then I think the other thing that um, a lot of us learned in that period was to try to figure out what it meant if you were a white radical to be in relation. So like, for example, when I was in New York right after college, I worked during the struggle over the New York City public schools to have community control. And I worked in, the com in a community that was black Puerto Rican and um, Chinese American. And after a while it became, and I, you know, being clear that certain things could be done by the women I worked with because they spoke the language, they were part of the community, but that I could do other things like handle the books and deal with the, st the funding sources so that they didn't waste their time. So you learned early, I think, what it meant to, to, to step back, to be really clear about what your role could be in a community. And I, so I think that formed a lot. Um, my own sense of, you know, of politics. And so when I was trying to figure out this title for Alan, I found this quote from, I'm going to read it from the book. It's from Alicia Garza, who's one of the co-founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. And she says, the thing I don't like about the word ally is that it is so wrought with guilt and shame and grief that it prevents people from doing what they ought to do. Co-conspiracy is about what we do in action not just in language. So I'm not going to argue that language isn't important. I've been a professor too long to not think <laughs> that it matters. But I think it, it's a modern version of what we used to say in the, old, in, the, in, the, in the new left, which was, you know, radicals do what liberals say they're going to do. So I think it is about thinking about really putting your life on the line and what it means to really do things. And I think Alan once went to a conference where the term, um, this is the one I really like, it's a, bon, it's a Bantu term called Ubuntu, U-B-U-N-T-U, and it means I am because we are, that is its sense of the connection of all humanity. Um, and I think for Alan, it wasn't about feeling guilty as a white person, I don't think, you know, it was about guilt or even about shame. It really was about Ubuntu, it was really about what does it mean to be in relationship, how do I best use the skills that I have in the furtherance of humanity, and how do I do that? And how he did that and how that changed over time is the story of his life, but it never was the same actions. But the, as he said over and over again, my principles never changed. Mm. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think that in some ways your book points to a whole new historiography that's needed to place both writing about the 1970s and the 1980s, which I would almost call like the late Cold War period. Um, there's a figure that comes to mind that you and I discussed after I read your manuscript, which is Donald Freed. So Donald Freed was this amazing activist who wrote a brilliant book, um, probably my favorite book on the conspiracy trial in New Haven and called Agony in New Haven. But he was interesting because he was, uh, when the 60s came along, he was already middle-aged. He knew Dalton Trumbo and the earlier generation of essentially the Hollywood black, the blacklisted artists um, in the Hollywood 10. And he became a direct ally of the Panther Party, but his activism continued long into the 1970s and 1980s. And one of the main things that he did is that he did a lot of nonfiction writing about the wars in Central America and the role essentially of US foreign policy abroad. But I interviewed him and what I was struck by was his discussion about how the Cold War, people focus on the 50s, often for the Cold War in the 60s, but it continues well into the 1980s. And the kind of repression that the generation of activists who start become politicized in the 1960s, how it continues really a trajectory of their whole lives. But becomes quite intense in the 1980s. So we definitely want to spend some time talking about that. So um, I wanted to ask you how you think um, Alan's experience of incarceration after the Brinks robbery or expropriation, whatever <laughs> language we want to use to talk about it, um, how that affected him and just the context really also of the 1980s. You know, when you were talking about the period when they went underground, that, for example, the targeting of the Senate was because of the invasion of Grenada. 
So in some ways, these radicals, as you said, you know, who are willing to do what liberals say they will do, they continue this, this vision of a militant support anti-imperialist politics with Ronald Reagan as president. So I'm wondering if you can talk about that, about his experience of incarceration in the Reagan era, Reagan and of course the first George Bush as presidency, and what kind of relationship it has to better known political prisoners like David Gilbert or Mumia Abu-Jamal, Herman Ferguson or Herman Bell. How do you situate that, that experience? So, um... So when Alan, um, I mean, part of it is, I think, you know, when they went underground, they sort of, um, on some level, though, you know, you can know it intellectually and not know it um, emotionally, of course. So intellectually, I think they all knew that there was a possibility that they would get killed. Um, and there was also a possibility that they would be in prison for the rest of their lives. Um, and they were willing to take that risk in part because... They were watching other people be already be incarcerated for um, decades um, anyway. And so I think they began to think that it was going to happen. So they might as well do something before they left. And, and well, I remember thinking when Reagan was elected, I mean, he gets elected, remember, in November, and then John Lennon gets killed in December. And I just remember thinking, oh, my God, the 60s have really died. I mean, this was, you know, this is the day the music really did die <laughs> in some way for my generation. And then what was the fight going to look like? And so for a lot of us in the 80s who weren't doing what Alan's group was doing, we're doing, you know, Central America support and really seeing the continuation of the Cold War no longer in Vietnam, but clearly in Central America in the way in which we supported the Contras and all of the horrendous murders, um, mass murders that are going on in, um, in Central America. So that's the context in which they're doing the work is if the imperialism has continued the battle with the Soviet Union, these proxy wars all over um, the planet are continuing um, to happen. And I think that's the context. So when Alan goes to prison as he writes to one of his um, friends. He said, look, I've been working in community health for 10 years at this point, pretty much. He said, I know, um, you know what these people's lives are like, but now I'm living with them. They're my roommates. So I th think it stopped being a kind of, even if he understood it sort of deeply, now he's in prison. And the purpose of putting him in prison as with all uh, people who get incarcerated is to belittle them, to make them um, feel like they're not human beings worth anything. Um, and there was just an enormous amount of that. And it, it came even clearer to him in two ways. One, his own medical experiences. So that, for example, I mean, like, so he, the first thing that happens is he's playing basketball. And, and this is six months in, he's playing basketball, he jumps up and he, and he tears his Achilles um, tendon. And they don't treat it properly. He, he really continued to limp actually because of it for the rest of his life. And he realizes they don't know what they're doing, that they won't take him to, bet, to, to real care. Um, when he finds a lump, um, which he begins to believe might be lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma, which actually killed his uncle um, who was at 54. So there's a history in the family of this disease. And Alan was in his early 40s when he first um, develops lymphoma. And the doctor who first examines him doesn't even know how to do it properly. And Alan has to say very politely, excuse me, sir, do you mind if I, if I raise my arm this way, that way you'll be able to see the lump a little bit, you'll be able to feel with the lump. So there are just these endless stories of his realizing that if he hadn't had the medical knowledge that they wouldn't have acknowledged. And then there just had to be these constant battles to get him any kind of reasonable um, care. And when he's in uh, Marion, in this control unit in, in Marion, uh, this prison in the Midwest, um, he realizes that he's the only licensed physician in the entire institution, that the physician supposedly in charge had gone to medical school, but had never, ever passed a bo his exams in any state. So, and the guy had no idea how to follow a, um, you know, a patient of this kind. So it reminds you, I think it reminded him constantly of the kind of care people get when they don't have the knowledge or the wherewithal or the money to get to decent care. And he saw that particularly when he got sent for a few months to Springfield to the medical, it's the medical prison um, that the feds run for people who need medical care. And he was completely horrified there by what people were being told, what he saw. So it's during his imprisonment that he gets his 
uh, prison moniker, which is Brother Doc, which um, an, a black Muslim um, uh, a friend uh, bestows on him because he's willing to help people learn the language that they need to use to try to make demands. He keeps helping them try to figure out what's going on. He starts doing some of the first HIV education in prison um, that happens. So I think his experience of the attempt to completely dehumanize him over and over to send him you know, in four point restraints to, uh, to medical care, to have guards standing over him when he comes out of anesthesia, to not have his family know what's happening to him, to not even know where he was. At one point, they really literally disappeared him into another prison. Um, those experiences over and over deepened his sense um, of the importance of uh, of how people of mass incarceration and what it meant, and it was also in this period that he was in prison at that point with Mumia Abu Jamal, and they become friends. Um, and he's completely horrified by the possibility that Mumia will be killed because at that point he's on death row. And Mumia helps him, like at one point, some guys were giving him a hard time about getting uh, his uh, to the telephone, and Mumia sort of explains to them who he is and. Over and over again, for example, the feds told false stories like they told um, people when Allen and a group of them become part of what's called the resistance conspiracy case, uh, which was an attempt to, to um, give them even more time because it was supposedly a conspiracy. And there in the, in the DC jail, they tell them that they were really part of a white um, supremacy group that tried to kill J uh, Jesse Jackson. That's the rumor that the feds deliver. And luckily by that point, there'd been a story about Allen as a part of a terrorist group that had been in Reader's Digest and people were passing that around. So he was able to counter that, but language like that could get a white guy killed in prison pretty easily or at least harmed or raped. And you know, it was this constant struggle for people to really understand what it was about and his real understanding that the length to which the state would go to dehumanize them. Yeah, and I think that that practice that you mentioned about, it's called snitch jacketing, that was used by the FBI, and it was deployed against a variety of people, but especially against white radicals that were allied with the wing of the black radical movement. Same thing with Donald Freed, who was labeled an informer and was nearly killed in Berkeley because of this kind of campaign of misinformation. Um, so I wanted to talk more about his turn to epidemiology, and you've given us kind of a thumbnail sketch of it, but I'd like to hear more about it, about kind of this turn towards public health. And also, it, it seems especially resonant right now. Um, I was 12 years old uh, when you were talking about the election of Ronald Reagan, and I, even though I was 12 and living in Erie, Pennsylvania, I felt exactly the same way that the world was coming to an end. Um, <laughs> But you know, when I think about the Reagan era, how I lived it, not just how I understand it now, but also how I lived it, is I, my core experience of it really was the AIDS crisis and the so-called crack epidemic. So they're the things that we talk about, the upward redistribution of wealth, the changing of the tax code, the foundational assault on labor with the air traffic controller strike being crushed, you know, the kind of political economy of Reagan, and then of course the incredibly aggressive anti-communist foreign policy that had catastrophic results for Grenada, for Nicaragua, for El Salvador, for Honduras, for precisely the countries today that are sending us so many migrants, largely because of this history of state violence and external intervention. Um, but that lived experience of Reaganism as the AIDS crisis of this complete abdication of real public health policy and the consequences that it had for people's lives. So I wonder if you could talk about um, Alan Berkman in the age of Reagan and after in terms of his activism and epidemiology and in particular the AIDS right. crisis. Right, so many of Alan's um, compatriots who end up in prison end up becoming um, AIDS educators. Um, so he would talk to them a lot while they were um, incarcerated in DC um, in the mid 80s. Um, and um, he was talking about AIDS and what it meant and he, they were beginning to see it in the prisons. Um, and there was a lot of um, you know, fear and anger, a lot of like the same kind of craziness we've had around COVID about whether or not you know you, you had to clean off your 
uh, your groceries, for example, or you know, not open the mail for two days or things like that. Same kind of idea around how could AIDS be transferred? People didn't know, people wouldn't help, people who had AIDS, all of those kinds of questions. So Alan and many of the other um, women and men he was part of became really important AIDS educators um, in their prisons. Um, and so when he finally gets out in 1992, his wonderful lawyer, Ron Kuby, is able to get New York State to agree to let him renew his medical license, which is amazing, if he promises to work with poor people, which of course, um, you know, was never a question. So he becomes this AIDS physician um, um, in New York um, during this time period. And, you know, he's interested in it, but he starts to really try to think about um, what, what does it mean to do this? And, you know, at, and he says this at one point in his, um, some of his autobiographical writing, you know, I have this reasonably decent political job. I'm helping people with AIDS, blah, blah, blah. You know, I have this nice apartment. I have enough money. I'm doing okay. I could have done all of this without prison and without cancer. What should both the prison experience and my cancer experience mean? Um, so I think he's trying to figure that out. And so during this period, what happens briefly is that uh, Barbara Zeller, his companion and comrade and wife, um, is also an AIDS physician in New York. And she goes to an international AIDS conference and um, re-meets um, a, a, a woman named uh, Zina, Zina Stein, who works as an epidemiologist at Columbia, who knew about Alan and Alan's story. And so Alan gets introduced to both to Zina and to um, Ezra and Mervyn Susser, who are both epidemiologists at Columbia. And so as Ezra Susser, who still teaches in the epidemiology department says, you know, here was this guy that um, had dropped out, um, you know, after his internship, and never written, frankly, I mean, I said there's never written anything except a pamphlet or a leaflet, right? No publications and a kind of 10 year gap in his resume, right? So he's disappeared from 82 to 92. He's not going to write about how do you get him hired or get him a job or get him training at an elite at system. Um, but Ezra realized, I think, that he, you know, he had all these interesting ideas and he could, so they brought him in on a fellowship at Columbia and they taught him how to do research and um, all of that. And then Ezra takes him to South Africa um, at the end of the 1990s to help um, the South Africans, uh, now that the ANC has won, think about sort of health policy. And Alan sees a lot of uh, what's going on. Um, you know, in South Africa. And so, as, as Ezra then says, you know, Alan had the worst possible resume to get him a job at Columbia, but he had the perfect resume to believe, be believed by people in South Africa because he'd been a political prisoner of the United States. So that um, people believed him and he was perfect for trying to reach out and help people in there. And so what happens to him is he goes to South Africa and he's watching the epidemic completely ex um, explode in South Africa. And then by this point, he's off parole, so he's 98. And he goes to Geneva to the International AIDS Conference. And the conference is called Bridging the Gap. And the discussion is supposed to be about bringing the antiretrovirals out of the global north to the global south. And it's not happening. And he's completely horrified by what he sees um, at this meeting. And then as part of their trip, because they're in Europe, they go to Germany and he goes to Dachau. Um, and he sees What's going? What what happened? Um, you know, to the to to the Jews and to other people um, in the concentration camps. So he's thinking again, I think, about what it means to be, um, what it means to be a, a good German and not do something about it. So by the time he comes back to New York in ninety eight ninety nine, he's really thinking about all of these issues, and that's when he starts to pull together his old comrades who were in ACT UP New York and in ACT UP Philadelphia, who then have contacts with people who understand things about trade policy. And they also, because it's actually an interesting story just in terms of movement building, it's the beginning of when the internet becomes more easily usable. So they're in contact with TAC, the treatment action campaign, which is just starting itself in South Africa around HIV AIDS. And so they're able to coordinate a kind of international and global movement, really a global movement, to try and change trade policy so that these drugs can become widely available. So I think it's that experience which moves him into thinking about 
how does he focus upstream? Can he continue to just be this physician medical director at the center? Or it, can he do something at Columbia that will help train another generation of health activists and epidemiologists to do the really important work? And also remember, he has like four or five more episodes of very serious cancer during this period. So his own sense of, as he put it, the parrot of death that sat on his shoulder, um, was, would come visiting quite often during those years. And so I think he really both understood the need for treatment in a way that many of us rhetorically sometimes don't. And also he understood the limits of his own time. Thank you so much for that, Susan. And um, all of you must read Co-Conspirator for Justice, The Revolutionary Life of Alan Berkman. So many important historical lessons, but also really for ways to think about especially in this moment of public health crisis and the continuities of radical activism. Um, so I, I see that we have a bunch of questions um, in the Q&A, so I thought this might be a nice time to open it up to the audience because we have many, many people here and lots of interest and questions for you. Um, okay. So, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so, so this is Baron. I'm just looking at the questions, and uh, I'll just sort of pose some of these questions that have been listed in the chat box. Um, there's one from Ken Rosenberg. Uh, it's sort of a general question, which I'm, you know, I know that a lot of us are sort of thinking as as the both of you have been speaking. Is sort of, um, so, what lessons do you think we should be taking today from Alan's life? Um, <laughs> sort of a big, large question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. Um, so, um, so I, I can answer that. So I will um, put in the, I guess, the Q and A box um, some links to, to Health Gap, and I will try to remember to do that before um, this ends. Um, of things that are being done by the Health Global Access Project to try to make sure that we fight to make sure that the vaccines, when they come out, first of all, are um, tested widely, not because there's any, bio, I want to be really clear about this, no biological difference um, be, between people are being tested, but because people's comorbidities um, might be different and we need to, and our immune systems change as we age, we need to be thinking, of, be mindful of testing widely to make sure that whatever vaccine gets out there is as safe and effective as we can possibly make it. Um, I keep hoping that uh, that uh, capitalism might in fact work in our favor this way. That is, it is not in the interest of these companies to have a disaster around um, their vaccines. And so I think they're fighting back and slowing down the process a little bit to make sure we have enough um, evidence. So I think that's one thing we have to fight to make sure that the vaccines are available. And I think we have to make sure that they're available afterward at a reasonable price, that we have to be really absolutely aligned with people in different kinds of communities to make sure that everybody um, can get this, can get this easily, can get it cheaply, and that the federal government has to be involved um, both in the United States, but also worldwide in terms of making this available. Because if we think just vaccinating, you know, healthcare workers and the rich and famous um, right now is gonna end this pandemic, we, we don't know anything. You have flunked epidemiology 101, let's put it that way. So I think that's the struggle. I'm gonna go um, see if I can find the link and put that in the Q&A right now while you uh, find me another question. Sorry, I forgot to do that. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, so we have another question here from Danielle uh, uh, Larak Arena. Um, it's a great question. So uh, since the death of my father, Paul Larak, and my uncle, Fra Frank Larak, I have not engaged in deep conversations with colleagues of radical thought to change our system. Uh, our medical system certainly does not promote this. Many of us in my generation grew up with political discussions at the table and urgent issues of justice. As a black Haitian physician, I grew up with all the thoughts you expressed. Where are we today? Okay, hold on just a sec. I'm trying to get this um, and I can't sit it. So I'm just gonna stick it in here. Um, okay, I hope that helps. Um, okay, I'm sorry. So the, 
the, uh, can you just repeat the question really fast? I'm sorry, I was just, I'm not a good multitasker, so I was trying to get this information in fast. Okay. Um, yeah, no, no, just, just uh, that, um, you know, where are we today in right. terms of uh, sort of social justice and right. sort of uh, the, 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 the questionnaire is sort of from a black Haitian physician yeah, who I, grew up with all the thoughts that you've expressed. And okay, so I see it today? now. Thank you, Barun. I see it. Um, I, I think, um, we're in a, actually, um, I mean, I don't want to sound like a Pollyanna, but I think we're at a, a, a semi-helpful movement that is obviously, as Donna said at the beginning, we had an enormous outpouring of outrage during um, the, the spring and summer around um, Black Lives Matter and those issues. Um, and then you're going to have a certain amount of falling away of people who are going to freak out um, about certain kinds of things. But I think a lot of us have, you know, watched friends and family die. We have watched what happened. Um, I mean, the 200 and, you know, what are we up to? 18,000 dead Americans at the moment and a million people probably dead worldwide. Make it really obvious that doing business as usual can't go on. We, we, we can't do this. We are not prepared to save ourselves. We, we just aren't. And we can't count on whoever is in the federal government to do it because it changes too quickly. Look what we've just happened in the last four years. So I think it's an argument for, you know, reading about what people like Alan done, have done. I think it's finding groups like Health Gap um, that he helped um, found that is still doing this kind of work. It's working in community groups. I think it's doing what we always talked about, which is both the kind of on the ground stuff. And then those of you who can work in, you know, in the institute, we used to call it the long march through the institutions was the phrase we used in the 60s and 70s. But you can be part of demanding that the courses deal with these kinds of issues, that you learn best practices about what can be done, how we can pressure the state to understand that public health can't be continually underfunded, which is what's been happening since the 80s, um, and that um, there's a way to do public health that doesn't mean that everybody's constantly in lockdown or being shamed into you know, putting on their seatbelt or not smoking or wearing their mask, that we have to really think about the positive ways we help people think about what it means to be in Ubuntu. I mean, I think that was the spirit of Alan's life and that's what, um, and then I think we also have to know that we're not alone when we do it. So I, you know, I was heartened by the woman who asked this question because obviously this is the conversation at her dinner table. That really matters. The question is um, how many dinner tables can we organize um, right now so that that continues and that we all find a role that's comfortable um, for us to do in whatever political way we can do it. Uh, thank you. Uh, so here, here's a question from um, Charlie Branis. Um, he says, um, sort of in the book, Susan uh, says of Alan that, quote, uh, I did not agree with his pol uh, political tactics, even when we shared basic beliefs. Alan Berkman himself seems to struggle with many of the tactics that were being used around him, especially violence. Despite some obvious distinctions, to the contrary, Alan seemed to represent the sort of every man uh, of the time in his journey. However, on another topic, uh, can you comment further on Alan's struggle as a male man uh, and what the book describes as his patriarchal tendencies? Wow. Right. Okay, so there really, Charlie has really has two questions here. One is about the issue, although they're obviously related, which is the, both the issue about um, political violence and the issue about masculinity and his feminism. So when I first started this project, people kept describing Alan to me as it was sort of like this saint, you know, a Jewish saint, as it were. And I kept thinking, this is not the guy I grew up with, right? I remember him as um, really, really competitive, really, really smart, really arrogant with an edge of anger. Um, and I had to call two of my high school girlfriends up and say, like, am I misremembering this person? You know, was, was, and they said, oh, no, he was like that. So one of the things that happens to him that happened at a lot of the sort of more sectarian political groups um, in the 70s, what was called rectification. And it was based on a sort of um, uh, and we did a versions of it in the women's movement too. It was called criticism, self-criticism, but it was a way in which at the end of a meeting, you would say, so like somebody like me would say at the end of the meeting, oh, I'm really sorry, I actually talked too much. You know, during the meeting, I should have 
been quieter so that my shyer sisters could say something. So we all learn to sort of think about our presentation of self, what our own, you know, privilege or articulateness did in terms of harming other people's ability to, to speak. Um, and to talk, and he went through that process. Um, he was also extremely impressed both by his, the women he took care of, um, both the mostly black and brown women that he took care of as a physician and their incredible strength and survival skills. And then the organization he was part of was primarily women and primarily lesbians. And I think he came to really appreciate and to understand their power. So as one of his comrades put it, he struggled his entire life um, not always successfully to control and to understand his um, his powerful masculinity and his brilliance, I think, in terms of trying to understand what it meant to listen um, and to hear other people's ideas and to understand, as he said to one of his friends when he was in prison, he wrote, you know, I had become the perfect test taking machine and I knew how to do all this and I was really good at it. He had a, we're pretty sure he had a photographic memory so he would like, and he would just listen to a lecture or he would look at a book and then he would have it completely memorized. So when you had stupid, you know, Q uh, you know, multiple guess exams or fill in the blank questions, he could fill them out and get a hundred on the test. But it didn't mean he learned anything. I once said that to a student who got it completely memorized the, the course and I was TAing for a professor and I wrote on her paper, I have to give you an A because you got all the answers right, but do not confuse this with thinking because <laughs> you haven't done any thinking. And I think he understood that. And so he also thought that a political movement had to be formed by people really listening hard to the people most affected. Okay. And on the violence, you asked about the violence. So I think while he's in prison, I think I wrote a sentence in the book, which I still think, I think he was very good at sort of being a revolutionary in the way he thought about that, but he wasn't very good at leading a revolution. So I think the confusion between what seemed possible in places like South Africa or in Cuba um, or, you know, in other places around the world as, as my generation watched the end of the colonial, you know, the, the ends of the colonialism in, in Africa and Alan's group was very involved in Zimbabwe, for example, um, that somehow that got confused with what could be done in the United States at this particular point in time. So I always thought it was really interesting that Bernie Sanders uses the term our revolution right, for his group in a way in which was not the term, the way in which Alan and the people around him thought about revolution at that point in time. Okay, so I'm um, going to sort of merge two sort of similar questions, one from uh, Stephen Arpati, the other one from Carla Kaplan. Um, but uh, so how do you think Alan's views evolved regarding how white radicals can best relate to movements of black lives. Um, and that's sort of merging into, given how vexed the question of white allyship is right now, what are lessons of allyship does Alan's life offer to us? Great. Um, I think one of the things for him, I mean, I think what's different for him than for most of us um, is that even if we get arrested, um, we're less likely to be beaten or killed when shot first. I mean, that's the most obvious thing. I mean, just watch what happened to the guy who did um, the killings in, Charles, in, um, in Charleston, um, South Carolina, where they take him out to the Burger King, right? They don't shoot him. Um, and um, we, we might see a little bit, I think it's really clear that the, the man who shot the, uh, uh, the um, MAGA guy in uh, Port, in, in either outside of Portland or Seattle now, I can't remember where on the West Coast, um, the cops clearly executed him before even announcing. But mostly white radicals don't usually get shot in quite that way. Obviously the people in Allen's group and Allen were tortured for sure in prison. But so one of the things I think that's really different is our realization of the risks for people of color that are really different than they are for whites. But I think one of the things that happens is you have, to, I think, so I think there are two things. One is our own responsibility to keep trying to organize other white people. I mean, I think that that's really important. I mean, I think a lot of us are still trying very hard to do that. And I think it's also trying to figure out which coalitions we feel like we can easily work in and what it means to um, think about what it really means to be a co-conspirator in those organizations and to take that kind of leadership without, you know, completely not saying anything. So Alan, for example, thought what happened at Brinks was really stupid, that they should never have done it. 
um, and he thought it was wrong. But then once caught up in it, once the woman who had shot her, Marilyn Buck had shot herself, he felt like he had to take care of her. And I think that that's absolutely um, correct, that he didn't have any choices. But we want to hopefully build a movement politically that doesn't force people to have to make that kind of, um, that kind of choice. Okay, thank you. So he, here's a question from Karen McKinnon. Um, Alan had a complex relationship to his own self-presentation. And I wonder if you were writing, I wonder as you were writing about him, if quote, summing him up, uh, even though all the lenses you use in your book, which I look forward to reading, felt like a transgression. Say the last sentence again, I'm sorry. Um, I wonder as, uh, as you were writing about him, if uh, summing up, even through all the lenses you use in your book, felt like a transgression. That was a transgression? Um, that felt like a transgression. Oh, felt like a transgression, huh. It's an interesting question. Um, I got accused actually by one of his former comrades of being too romantic about him, um, which is always hard because you know, you can't spend that many years writing about somebody without kind of trying to be inside their um, life in their head and to explain it a bit. But, um, you know, it felt a little weird, I, I have to say, in trying to sum up this, this change, but I thought it was, I did the best I could, I guess, I'm not trying to be defensive here about what it meant. And I think other people can read, I mean, that's the thing about a book, you know, it's an open to any kind of interpretation you want about, hopefully I've led you to think about certain kinds of things and how he's uh, moved, but, um, you know, you can make your own decision about whether I've done that successfully. I don't know how else to kind of answer that. I'm not quite sure what she means by a transgression in that sense. Okay, well, why, why don't we move on to the next question? This is, this is from uh, uh, Slim Abdul Karim. Um, uh, he says, uh, uh, thanks for an amazing session. Uh, Karisha and I had the honor of working with Alan in his supporting role. Um, the AIDS response in South Africa with its complicated president's denialism at the time. What struck me was Alan's impressive abilities to incisively analyze a situation from a joint medical, social, political lens in a way that just makes the next course of action so clear. That's great. Um, how, when did he develop this amazing multidimensional political public health approach? So, um, I, that's a great um, question. I mean, he obviously didn't learn it in public health school in the sense that we um, think about that. And he, we certainly didn't learn it at, you know, as an undergraduate. I think um, he always had this incredibly, um, I mean, his political comrades who knew him in the political mo movements before he becomes an epidemiologist can confirm this. He had this brilliance uh, and an ability to see both of the moment and of the larger picture and to try to figure out how to get there. So some people are really good at um, strategy and some people are really good at sort of imagining the world and what has to be done. I mean, you can see that if you uh, want to see a really terrible movie about that, go watch Aaron, Aaron Sorkin's uh, movie on the, on the, on the uh, Chicago 7 trial because you get this sense of, um, you know, uh, Abby Hoffman as a sort of interesting strategic thinker, but the bigger picture is Tom Hayden and Randy Davis, and he gets a lot of it wrong, but you get a sense of those tensions in movements, I think, in that film, however badly and really badly it's done. So I think the same thing for Alan, he had this, in, but he was unusual in his ability to basically say, look, here's the big principle and the concerns that we have, um, as Dr. Um, the physician has just told us, but he also could say, and here are the intermediary steps in order for us to get there. So he no longer thought you could shoot your way to the end point, right? That's, that's, and you couldn't bomb your way to the answer. You had to figure out who to be in coalition with, what step made sense first, um, how to think about that. And that's what made him a brilliant, I think, um, public health tactician. Um, and some of it probably came from uh, really failing 
I mean, if you think about him, they failed. As an organization, they failed. As human beings who then, all of them, absolutely every single one of them, go on to do amazing political work, both in their prisons and then when they get out, all of them, that never goes away. That sense of responsibility to Ubuntu continues throughout their lives. And he was part of that, and that's what it meant. Um, here's a question from Tim Lacey. Uh, what were Alan Berkman's favorite books on politics, public health, racism, and global health? Um, I think I'd have to ask Barbara <laughs> Zeller that question. I, um, I, didn't get, I got his thumb drive actually from his computer at, at uh, Columbia. So I, uh, all of you he wrote recommendation letters for are probably living on my computer right now. But um, I, you know, he read really, really widely. I mean, obviously in the beginning he read a lot of Lenin. And so there's a funny story from one of his close friends, Dick Clapp, um, who's an epidemiologist and who'd been in medical school with him. And Dick tells the story of coming, there were roommates at that point in Boston and he comes in and Alan says, I'm writing Lenin. And then he goes, no, 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 I'm reading Lenin. <laughs> so I think obviously he was reading a lot of uh, that kind of stuff. But when he's in prison, for example, he's reading, I know he's reading Toni Morrison. He's in deep conversation with a woman who was a Quaker who talked to him a lot about spirituality um, kinds of questions. He um, he read Camus, he was read, he was always a bit of an existentialist, so he read those kinds of things. So I think um, one of the things about being in prison and one of the ways he survived it was that he spent a lot of time reading, you know, a lot of time reading whatever he could get his hands on um, and a lot of thinking about what they had done and what they hadn't been successful at it, what it would mean to be more successful politically. So I think it's that. And then he also, you know, he had the education that came from being part of this political movement. So if you think about all, I mean, he get, gets to spend time with Mumia. He gets to spend time with a guy named Joe Daugherty, who had, he was in prison. He was roommates with him, or cellmates with him um, in New York. And uh, Daugherty had been part of the IRA. And so they had this long conversation about the IRA and what it did. He's in prison at one point with Filiberto uh, um, Olias from the FALN. So he has these, um, what we would call organic intellectuals and political people who really are part of his education. So it's not just the reading, Tim, I think it's all the other stuff as well. Okay, um, I just wanted to read a comment from uh, Susie Hoffman. Um, uh, you know, uh, on this topic, uh, uh, this reminder uh, of Alan's life and struggle is so moving, especially in these days when even very moderate liberals are being labeled socialist. And so many people are supporting an autocratic regime. So it was just a comment from Susie Hoffman. That's nice. Um, yeah. yeah. Could I respond to that? Yes, of course. Um, and it, it might be nice, Susan, for you and I to think about this in conjunction with one another. I mean, one of the things about Alan's life that I think is so important is that he's ref he, his life also reflects the generational experience of a whole group of people that became politicized and radicalized in the 1960s and 1970s. So whether it's Alan coming from a working class Jewish family and then going to Cornell and being at Columbia during the Columbia strike, or in my story about these working class black migrants out of the South who migrate to the West Coast and gain access to higher education in California when there are no fees or tuition. Um, but in many ways, and this speaks also to what you were talking about, the possibility of someone like Alan, given his own history, both his activism and his incarceration and his you know, having, let's call it a less than perfect resume, was still able <laughs> to become a professor at Columbia in its public health school, that a lot of the infrastructure of the 60s and 70s that helped create these radical movements, you know, public, public education and even private schools in many ways were much more accessible to larger numbers of people, especially vulnerable populations and lower income populations. And I think it's one of the core contradictions of the Cold War that, you know, certainly in the case of the West Coast, where the funding for higher education was so linked to the Cold War because it was seen as part of the arms race. So I'm curious about that question that, you know, comparing, co comparing and contrasting those post-war years with today, because some of the infrastructure that helped nurture that 
um, in many ways doesn't exist in the same way. It may be that there are other kinds of possibilities now. And I'm curious what you think about that. Yeah, I, what came to mind as you asked that question was um, a quote I always like from my old labor history days from um, a labor activist and a journalist named Mary Heaton Borst, in which she said, this was at the, in the 1910s and 20s, she said that uh, a strike is uh, the university for workers. Um, so part of the problem is, you know, I mean, Donna is in a really active and important union at Rutgers, but most people don't have uh, the experience of the union movement. But we can have the experience of the numbers of NGOs that now exist and all the nonprofits and organizations that have tried to make change and policy. And I think we won't get the, we don't have the kind of infrastructure people are in so much. I, I mean, I watch this with my, my students who are so in debt when they finish college that they have to take the fanciest business-like job they can get because they can't pay off their debts any other way. And when I told my students that I was 38 years old before I made more than $10,000 a year, right, because I had been doing movement work or I was in grad school, um, they look at me like I'm crazy, but I also was paying $100 a month for my five-floor walk-up with the slate bathtub in the kitchen in New York, right? So I didn't have to make more than $100 a week, which is what I was making, actually, in the 70s um, to survive, but I also didn't have school debt because I went to a state school and my parents, you're going to die, paid $200 a year to send me to college for tuition. So I think the material conditions, as Donna has really laid them out, are so different. But I also think the places to learn about the contradictions of what's going on in the world are also much more vast. I mean, the only thing we can thank the Trump administration for, as far as I'm concerned, is pulling the veil off a lot of what was much more invisible and was going on before just less visibly to a lot of people, not to all everybody, obviously, to the people who were being harmed, it was never invisible, but to a larger swath of America, the the horror of what we do, what we can do in this country um, is pretty obvious, I think, right now. And so I, my hope is that even if the infrastructures that were possible for us don't exist, a different set of infrastructures um, do exist now. And so I guess that's my optimistic sense of what's, you know, <laughs> what's possible um, now about where you can help, where you can be involved, what you can do. And I think the ways in which, I mean, I don't believe in sort of social media activism, but it's been so interesting. I've been making phone calls, for example, to Michigan. And I kept thinking how different this is than in the old days where you had to go somewhere where there was a phone bank and you had to keep calling these people. And now I just push a button, sit on my computer and bing, bing, I'm, I'm talking to some guy in, you know, in Michigan five seconds later. I mean, it's sort of still utterly amazing to me that I can do that in the comfort of my own home. So there's that. Um, just quickly to an er earlier question about books, um, there's a comment here from Barbara Zeller uh, ah. <laughs> that he read, uh, he read Zena and Mervyn's uh, epidemiology book, uh, which made a huge, huge impression. Um, and uh, another one from Richard Clapp, Alan liked The Imagination of the New Left, The Global Analysis of 1968. Um, so those are two sort of uh, comments to an earlier question. Uh, but here's sort of a comment slash question from Ezra. Um, one thing I remember about Alan after prison was the attention and sympathy he gave to almost everyone as a unique individual. But that may not have been true in his earlier phases. Do you think this emerged from the prison experience or otherwise? What might have explained this change, if I'm right? <laughs> About yeah, being a I think Ezra's assessor uh, is absolutely right about this. And um, I, I was always struck by when I started interviewing a lot of the men, for example, at Columbia who knew him and worked with him, that everybody thought of him as sort of their best friend, which I thought was just completely um, fascinating. And I, I think that the experience of prison and the attempt to make him not matter and to make nobody matter, to make them um, agreed that they were the animals that the, the COs, the corrections officers and the state tried to make them into, burned into his soul so deeply that he was absolutely committed to not having that happen. 
that he had lived both in terms of what he saw with everybody else and also what happened to him. And then the most dramatic story that he tells, it's in the book, I think this helps explain it, is that he is going into um, septic shock at one point after his treatment. He's completely paralyzed from his neck down. He's in this prison ward. And um, he starts yelling because he realizes he's going into septic shock. He can hear the guards and the nurses outside his uh, room listening to a football game. And he, he knows he's about to die if something doesn't happen. And they won't respond to him. And so he realizes that if he, if he mends the neck, which is the only thing he can move, he can cut off the IV line, which sets off an alarm. So because he's able to do that, the nurse then comes in. And he says, I've been screaming at you for an, half an hour now. Why didn't you come? And she says to him, well, you guys scream all the time. We just don't listen. So, you know, had he not known that that's what would happen, he would have been dead. So I think that powerful experience of counting for nothing meant that he made sure when he got out that everybody he dealt with counted for something. Um, okay, so it's related to that point, Leslie Davison, again, sort of um, sort of talking about experience of hers. Uh, one day I was uh, extremely frustrated about academic bureaucracy. I asked him how he was able not to get angry. He told me that it was not always that way, that he learned this while he was in prison. Yeah. Um, so I, that that makes an, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think uh, here there's one other question. Um, for, um, from Charlie here. Um, okay, so this is sort of tying it back to public health. Is um, is there a bigger lesson for epidemiologists and public health people when Alan was quoted as saying, "quote Be willing to act, even though the decision to act carries the risk of being wrong." Yeah, I, I do. I, I mean, you know, it, it's a little hard. I mean, I, I keep thinking when you said that, I kept thinking about the way in which Trump says, well, Fauci said at the beginning, don't you wear masks, but then he did say wear masks, right? So I think um, what public health has to do is it has to, you know, we used to say dare to struggle, dare to win was the, the phrase, but I think we have to dare to struggle. I think we have to do our best to reach out, to speak to the best of what we can possibly do in public health, even if we're wrong. And because I think one of the things that's a problem right now is honestly these signs that say, just trust the science, as if the science was always so clear about what was necessary. So I went to interview, this is the final story. I mean, I interviewed David Sensor, who had been the head of the CDC for years. So in 1976-77, uh, it looked like there was gonna be a huge swine flu epidemic. So he convinces uh, Gerald Ford, the president, that every, we should have this mass vaccination campaign. But in fact, we don't have a swine flu epidemic that year. And then Censor gets fired because of this bad, you know, information that he gives to the president. But he said to me, I followed the science. The science made us think that this is what was going to happen. So I think it's really important that we do the best science and the best public health that we can do. But we also have to realize that sometimes we're really really wrong. Okay, great. Uh, you know, I just wanted to add, um, you know, I know there's a lot, a fair number of people on this call and, uh, you know, perhaps a lot of them are also Alan's friends. And if there was anything that, uh, you know, you know, they wanted to say, or if you want to say, uh, just please let us know in the Q&A. We have a few more minutes left um, and you know we can certainly turn on the audio um, if you want to um, sort of uh, uh, you know uh, mention something about Alan um, and uh, but on, on that note I just wanted to add to what was said slightly earlier it's from David Rosner uh, about sort of uh, you know Alan sort of his uh, kindness um, you know he said just to add Alan was so kind to my son when he was uh, interested in going to South Africa. He introduced him to Zachary Ahmed at Treatment Action Campaign, and I felt it changed his life. He really went out of his way for a kid he didn't even know. Uh, so that's very nice. Um, and yes, I think we have Laura Whitehorn. Um, oh, great. Yes, um, I'm gonna ask somebody to turn on the audio.
I think I'm unmuted now, which is, might be dangerous. Um, <laughs> thanks so much for this. It's so great to be here with Donna, too, as well as Susan. Um, what I wanted to say is that one of the things about Alan, I, I agree with you, Susan, that prison uh, deepened some things, but his sense of empathy, he struggled for it. He didn't always feel it, but he knew it was really deep. Um, I want to say another thing, which is that we were brought up short in, um, in the 70s over the difficulties and sometimes our errors in how to support the Black Liberation Movement in particular. And he struggled with that, we struggled with that. And so some of the question of solidarity for him and for us was so much about trying to get that right, and we didn't always. The last thing I just want to say about Alan is that he always thought you shouldn't say shit unless you're willing to do it. That you shouldn't be telling other people what to do. You know, you might not be able to, maybe you're in prison and you can't be out there, but you should never be like big mouthing and showing off and, you know, go, you know, we didn't think that we could shoot our way to the revolution. We thought that around the, around the world, there was hard <laughs> struggle was part of revolution and that to build for that, we should do that. But we did it because he was really the clearest about this. If you think something's right, you got to do it, even if it's hard. And he often said, if you're faced with a decision about what to do, look at the harder, the harder path and really be careful that you're not avoiding it because it's hard. So, you know, I think that's why we all loved him so much. He was always willing to put his body. Right, his right. Thank you, Laura. Only those who really knew him deeply. Again, as I said, I knew him as a kid and as an adolescent, and I only came to know him as a man in this book. And there's always the difference between what a historian can know and what the people who knew and worked with him and loved him for years and years and years can know. Great. And I think we have um, Alfredo Moravia, who's going to say a few words. Hi, Alfredo. Yeah, hi. Hi, Donna. Hi, Susan. I, I think you were absolutely fantastic, both the moderator and the author. I mean, it was a fascinating discussion, and uh, I'm very impressed. I, I want to say something. Donna said we need to have a, a, a larger, you know, uh, bibliography and, and, and story of the radicalization of the the white left in the 60s, 70s. But I think this is what's the strength of Susan's book. It's a book about the generation. I mean, we have Alan's story, but Alan's story spans over the 60s until the 90s. And this allows her to cover all the different steps that generation, you know, uh, underwent and some people you know like like Alan went into uh, clandestinity and, and armed struggle but other you know went to the Midwest and became workers and established themselves I mean right this whole these people underwent a very similar history than Alan but this books brings this together in a way that I had never read before and that's why I say I was absolutely uh, fascinating all the way, and I invite everyone to read it. I, I appreciate that, but Don, this is the historians, the two of us here will tell you, you need more than this. You real, I mean, I appreciate Alfredo that this is just a start, and I built on the work of a lot of other of my um, historian colleagues, and there's just a lot more to, to, to mine here and to understand going forward. Um, so that, you know, we understand it, but I appreciate that. Thank you. But there's just, you know, it's one person's story and one lens, um, and there's just much more to tell. Um, if I could respond to, thank you so much for that comment, Alfredo. And I also absolutely adore Susan's book and thinks, think it's such a foundational contribution. And I guess it whet my appetite for more. You know, one of the problems is that I think that in terms of the history of the white left, I flag that as a Black Power historian and an African American, African Americanist, because I just have seen, you know, there have been dissertations written that haven't been published. And one of the problems with this is that we're seeing an enormous rebirth in the left in the United States right now. It's incredibly exciting. 
You know, I'm involved with our union, which is the radical left-led union, in many ways, the pre-Taft-Hartley union. We're also seeing the birth of all these new socialist publications, you know, whether it's Tempest or Rampant or Spectre, we have the growth of democratic socialists, of DSA, and all these different kinds of socialist affinity groups. But one thing that I'm really struck with is that many of them are hearkening back to the left of the 1930s. And the 1930s is an incredibly important period, but it's almost like we have a lost history of, of the new left. And I think that that's Susan's book is speaking to this about trying to understand, I think because of the changes in the, in the university and the expansion of African-American history and African-American studies, this really has been done for the Black Liberation Movement and there's still an enormous amount to still do there. But the problem with this lost history is that I think, and Susan's book is an exemplary example of this that will point the way for other books like it, but we need that history and we need it today to think about you know, the rebirth of the idea of solidarity, understanding what that means and claiming some of this history of the left as part of, you know, the United States is such a complex country with many different kinds of people in it. And I think that this is an area that we need to revisit. My concern is that people like Daniel Bell, who was at Columbia also in the 1960s, they won the argument and calling really the condemnation of what was called the new left. And so I'm, I'm anxious to see more work like this that will provide Alan Berkman. And of course, I'm honored that Laura Whitehorn came. I was thinking of her um, as I was talking this whole time about her as also Alan's counter counterpart and other people like them. Thank you. May I, may I say something, Varun? Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. I. I totally agree. I mean, we need this historiography and this is one person. But remember, some of the best histories of the 19th centuries are novels with specific heroes that had one characteristic. They were anti-conformist throughout their life. You know, whether it's Sorel, where, whether it's Fabri Dongo, whereas you, you name them in Stendhal or in, uh, in Flaubert. You know, these heroes, they don't, uh, they don't change without their life and they're against the establishment. And there is something of this in Susan Reverby's book, in Allen. And he's, he's a kind of 19th century hero and she has been able to reproduce that. It doesn't replace all the historiography we need, but it plays an, a, an invaluable role on understanding the psychology of the people who went through this era. Right, right. Well, thank you. I don't, I don't think I'm quite Stendhal. It's really sort of lovely. And um, it's, it's actually an irony for me. You have to understand that this book started in part because um, my colleague David Rosner at Columbia and I are kind of infamous in the history of medicine for this essay we wrote called Beyond the Great Doctors, in which we argued when we were actually graduate students um, in the late 70s that the history of medicine had to be more than the great doctors and the great men, right, and their ideas. So that the, um, the idea that I would write about a great white doctor at some point in my life was kind of ironic and hilarious on some level. And part of the reason I, I actually did it was because I thought, well, who else should do this except someone who thinks that this is not really how history gets made. Um, but it is also true that biography and fiction and novels gives us a way to hold on to a theme through a book and through some person's life that can illuminate a larger movement. So it's always difficult when, when you teach social movements, it's sometimes really hard for students um, to follow it because there's so much of movement history that is what I used to call, you know, da 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 history. And then Joe and Sam got together and then Mary and Jim got together and blah, blah, blah. And then they voted on this and, it, and then by then you're falling asleep, right? And the only people who find it interesting are the people who were there themselves and went, oh, I didn't know Jim used to do that. So I think it's a struggle for historians to find the right balance between that. And I think that's why you get terrible movies like Sorkin's because I think it's a struggle to try to figure out how to tell this story so that people of a different generation can identify with the issues. And sometimes you just have to do it around individuals or movements with moving parts and characters and stuff like that. And I just think it's a writing and intellectual problem. I don't know, Donna, what do you think? Um, I agree with what you said. I mean, I think one of the challenges 
is thinking about how to write histories of movements in which we have rank and file histories versus leadership histories. Uh, because the flip side of the kind of heroic biography is the erasure of the infrastructure that made that person's emergence possible. Right. So I, I understand exactly what you mean in terms of there's something about the way that individual lives can be told. They are so powerful. An individual life allows this process of identification, and that's very important. Um, I think especially in the post-war period, this is one way that the 20th century is quite different from the 19th century, that I think there's such an explicit engagement in creation of histories from the bottom up and the transformation of the university. And a lot of that takes place in the context of the universities being democratized in the US and Western Europe, that many more working class people are able to attend the university. And so there's kind of a deconstruction of the great man or great woman. Um, so I think that even in how Alan understood his activism, I think is influenced by this period in which it's really trying to take populations that have been invisible and push them forward and make them visible and make them centered. And so a lot of that discussion, whether it's black versus white or leadership versus rank and file, is about trying to hold up people whose histories are normally erased. Right, right. Right. I mean, that's certainly how I came into history. I mean, the first um, book I ever did, I edited with two other people called, it's called America's Working Women, a documentary history. And it was about working class women's uh, labor struggles over time. And I did it because I was forced to read the, the John R. Commons documentary history of uh, the working class, all nine volumes of it. And um, never did he mention that the only reason he could go to graduate school was that his mother ran a boarding house so that she could get money to feed him so that he could go to grad school. And it just drove me to distraction. So a lot of us who came into women's history um, out of the 60s and 70s came that way, or we came out of, at least for me, I came out of labor history, but I came out of labor history into, thank God, E.P. Thompson and the entire sort of uh, left writers, uh, le labor writers who wrote about class and infrastructure, not about um, institutions and labor unions and meetings and things like that. And so I learned that you could actually, that's why I went back to graduate school. I read E.P. Thompson and realized, oh God, this is actually interesting and actually has some relevance to the political work I'm doing. And I don't have to write great man history. So I certainly hope that Alan's book, I do think he was a great man, but I hope it's not great man history. Let's put it that way. <laughs> So um, we're out of time, but I just wanted uh, to create a little bit uh, for a short comment from one of Alan's friends and co-founder with him of Health Gap, Bob Letter. Bob? Thank you very much. And, um, and thanks to Susan and Donna for this wonderful, um, thoughtful discussion. Um, yeah, so I had known and worked with Alan in the above ground anti-imperialist movement of the uh, late 70s. And then, um, you know, corresponded with him in prison. But um, when, by the time he got out, I was active in ACT UP as a, as a very committed uh, gay liberation activist myself. And so um, after that trip that Susan described uh, to Geneva, to the International AIDS Conference with that hypocritical title of Bridging the Gap, and then the trip to Dachau, um, he was on fire. He came back to me and and my, my partner, John Riley, who was also an ACT UP leader, um, and said, uh, we've got to do something about this, this genocide of our time in, throughout the global south uh, that is just um, unacceptable because of pharmaceutical greed and, and governments that uh, sanction it through trade policies. Um, do you think ACT UP would be interested because you're, you're the only activist I know doing this work and without their support, it's not gonna happen. And we said, it's a brilliant idea. And he, he laid out a strategy paper that he had written with the support of his Global South comrades from Brazil and South Africa uh, about how this was actually doable through a step-by-step -step campaign culminating in the, uh, the, the then scheduled International AIDS Conference in Durban, South Africa in the year 2000, that this could massively embarrass the US and the drug companies on the world stage. And we both thought, John and I thought this was a brilliant plan, um, but we don't know if the predominantly white ACT UP membership will go for it. 
And but because of the work that a lot of AIDS activists had done in raising consciousness about um, the global South, the AIDS in the global South, and the the genocidal neglect, um, we were hopeful. And anyway, we we pushed successfully to make ACT UP kind of a lead player in this. And working with Alan and and another ACT UP member, really uh, visionary member named Eric Sawyer, uh, together we convened the first phone call of about 10 different AIDS organizations in January of 99. And that led to the creation of Health Gap and all of the, the wonderful accomplishments that they've made in, in their, their time since then. So it all goes back to Alan and his um, brilliance on the one hand and fierce anti, uh, his commitment to fight genocide, um, whether in the global South or here, uh, in this country among people of color. And um, uh, I'm just forever grateful to, to him that uh, he offered me the chance to be uh, a little part of making history on a grand scale. So thank you, Alan. I thank think you, Bob. Yeah. I also wanted to say yeah, thank God for people like Bob and John who saved the emails and saved everything. So any of you involved in everything for the future of historians who are gonna go nuts because there won't be letters anymore, kindly print out those emails and text messages and hang onto them so we can understand how these things happen. Well, I think, uh, no, thank you. Uh, this has been absolutely um, fantastic. And you know, I think most will agree, not yet a, just another Zoom call. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, uh, Susan and Donna, thank you so much for your wisdom and your time. Um, it, this has really been s spectacular. And uh, to everyone else, um, again, thank you for attending. Um, well, I hope you all have a great day. Thank, thank you so much. You. I'm actually going to go vote now. Bye. <laughs> oh, fantastic. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> thank you, guys. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you.